Thank you very much indeed for the introduction and I must say I'm genuinely really thrilled to be able to talk uh, to this, this community today. The, among the spies, the Mossad agents who I met and who participated in this most incredible operation were, as a matter of fact, a, a number of Holocaust survivors. And I will uh, hopefully come on to that as I try to cover a lot of ground uh, in my presentation. Uh, I, if you see me glance to the corner of my screen like that, it's only because I'm keeping an eye on the time. I'm going to uh, attempt to uh, talk for about 40 minutes and also use some slides as well to uh, enhance the, uh, the, the talk with some uh, visual um, presentations, which I think you'll find very interesting. As, uh, as Karen said, I'm the author of uh, Red Sea Spies, which it was released earlier this year and it's a project which I've been working on for about the past couple of years. Uh, my day job is as a journalist. I've been a journalist for about 30 years, a long time. In all that time, I can honestly say, and I deal a lot with uh, stories to do with Israel, I haven't come across anything quite like the story which is told in the book Red Sea Spies. The reason I'm so passionate about sharing the story is because, yes, it's fantastic. It's incredible what the Mossad accomplished, but it's also a most important part of Jewish heritage, which I knew almost nothing about when I started out on this, on this journey. And so it's actually, I feel like a moral obligation to share uh, the, the tale of what took place with really with as many people as possible and the reasons why I hope will become clear by the end of my talk. Essentially the story is about a Mossad-led operation which spirited Ethiopian Jews from hiding in Sudan to Israel in the early 1980s. This operation led to perhaps the, the better known Operation Moses but without, what, without the accomplishment of what the Mossad achieved, there wouldn't be any Ethiopian Jews in Israel today. As a matter of fact, when, when this operation started out, the Jews of Ethiopia were on the brink of extinction. When I was researching for my book, I came across a magazine. I have a copy of it here. It's called Cultural Survival. Cultural Survival is still, still going. But this was written 40 years ago in 1983. And it was, a, it was a feature called The Plight of Ethiopian Jews. Now bear in mind the date, it's 1983. The concluding line in this magazine, Cultural Survival, which is a magazine which advocates for the preservation of minorities around the world. So it knew a thing or two about minorities under threat. It says, Ethiopian Jews constitute the most threatened Jewish community in the world. 1983, Ethiopian Jews were on the brink of extinction. This is what cultural survival declared. But what they didn't know was that the Mossad were already there and the operation to save the Jews from the brink of extinction was underway. I'm going to start to share some images with you now, which I hope will uh, add some understanding as to uh, what it is I'm going to talk about. So, okay, hopefully, Karen, perhaps you can indicate, you can see uh, a slide which says Red Sea Spies. Okay, you're nodding, that's a good sign. Oh, I, I just must share this, you just have to allow me a little bit of self-indulgence here. What you see here, this picture is obviously Benjamin Netanyahu. He's on the telephone. He's, he's talking to uh, the ruler of the United Arab Emirates. I'm kind of going off on a tangent here, of course. And it's a picture which uh, he himself posted on his Facebook page a couple of weeks ago. I happened to come across it as I was scrolling through my feed. And then something just caught my eye because in the background behind his shoulder here, which I've enlarged on this side, is a copy of my book on the shelf of the Israeli Prime Minister, which is really 
that's something which <laughs> I wasn't prepared for, absolutely blew me away. So when we talk about the Ethiopian Jews, who are they? Where do they come from? And quite frankly, why are they important enough for an operation to have taken place? What you see here are Ethiopian Jews. This picture was taken probably in the early 1980s, somewhere in the northern highlands of Ethiopia, which is where, where the Jews lived. Just to put it into some geographical context, I'll explain what we're seeing here. On the left hand side, this more colourful of the two maps, is the regional view. Israel, we all know where that is. Egypt to the south here. South of Egypt is Sudan. Sudan is very important to this story. Sudan's eastern neighbour is Ethiopia. And I've also indicated some important uh, places. Gondor. Gondor was a, a, one of two major centres of Ethiopian life in Ethiopia. When I talk about the Northern Highlands, you can see here, this is the north of Ethiopia, a mountainous area. Over the border in Sudan, I've located a place called Gadaref. And the reason I'm talking about this now to begin with is because I'll mention these places again. Gadaref was a major refugee, uh, a major settlement for refugees, full of camps. Khartoum, as we know, is the capital of Sudan. On the coast here, the Red Sea coast, I've located two places. One is Port Sudan, well-known, famous port. Just hidden behind it because I couldn't magnify the, the map, but about 40 miles or so north of Port Sudan is a place called Arus. It's not well known, but it's central to the story because Arus was the site of the Mossad's fake diving resort, a holiday village which they established as a cover in order to carry out this incredible operation behind enemy lines. The black and white map on the right hand side is just kind of a magnified uh, view of Ethiopia with Sudan here. The broken line is the border and the, the hatched area is where the Ethiopian Jews uh, dwelt. They lived in about 400 villages scattered across the mountains. There's Gondar. From north to south it's not very large, it's about 250 kilometres. I'll come on to this uh, slide again in a second. So who are the Ethiopian Jews and where do they come from? It's a brilliant question because really nobody knows for sure. Their origins are shrouded in obscurity. There are, are, there are a lot of competing theories, even among scholars, as to where their origins li uh, lie. How come there were any Jews in Ethiopia? It seems strange that there is such a thing as black Jews. A number of theories, as I say, various schools of thought. One is that the Jews in Ethiopia came from Yemen. There was actually a Jewish kingdom in Yemen, which was conquered by the rulers of uh, previously it's known as Aksum, northern Ethiopia, and the Jews were taken to Ethiopia across the Red Sea. So the one theory goes. Another is that the Jews of Ethiopia are descendants of the Jews of Egypt. But perhaps the most exotic theory is this one. This image is from a painting. It's in the, uh, the British Museum. What it depicts is the Queen of Sheba, this figure in blue here, greeting the Jewish King Solomon. So the story went that the Queen of Sheba heard about Solomon's wisdom and she paid him a visit in Jerusalem and they had relations and she bore a son. The son's name was Menelik. When Menelik, Menelik was a teenager, he went to visit his father. When, he, when Menelik departed from Jerusalem, Solomon sent with him a retinue of Jewish foot soldiers. And so the theory goes, and it was maintained for many centuries, including by the Ethiopian Jews themselves. It's been discounted now. But the story went that Ethiopian Jews are the descendants of the Jews who guarded the Holy Temple in Jerusalem. 
according to the uh, Ethiopian Orthodox Christian tradition, when Menelik left Jerusalem, he stole the Ark of the Covenant, brought it back to Axum. And to this very day, Ethiopian Orthodox Christians uh, maintain that the Ark resides in a church in Axum. And down the centuries, the rulers of Ethiopia claimed that they were the real chosen people, not the Jews, but the Ethiopian uh, Christians supplanted the Jews as God's chosen people. As late as the end of the 19th century, the late 1800s, the Jews lived in isolation in Ethiopia. There had been no contact, they were completely cut off from the rest of world Jewry. But remarkably, they practiced an authentic form of Judaism. They were scrupulous in how they maintained the commandments. But the difference between Ethiopian Jews and let's call it mainstream Jewry, whatever we mean by that, I mean non-Ethiopian Jews around the world, is that Ethiopian, the form, of, the form of Judaism that the Ethiopian Jews practiced was not rabbinical. They knew nothing about Jewish traditions or the Talmud because they had split off at a time in history before, uh, before Talmudic, uh, rabbinical and uh, Jew Jewish laws were made on the basis of the oral law. But what I omitted to say when I talked about the origins of Ethiopian Jews is the school of thought which is accepted now by the Rabbonim, by the State of Israel, and by the Ethiopian Jews themselves. And it is that they are the descendants of the biblical tribe of Dan. Dan was one of the ten so-called lost tribes. The ten lost tribes were members of the twelve uh, Jewish tribes, ten of whom were taken off into captivity by the Assyrians when they conquered the northern kingdom of Israel in the, in the, in the ninth century BC. So it's accepted that Ethiopian Jews come from the tribe of Dan. But as I said, it wasn't until the end of the 19th century that they came into contact with other Jews from other parts from outside Ethiopia. They were visited for the first time by a non-Ethiopian Jew in the 1870s. His name was uh, Joseph Halevi. When Halevi introduced himself as a Jew, he was French, he was Polish French, he was a white man. The Ethiopian Jews didn't believe that he was Jewish because they believed that they were the only surviving Jews on the planet. There was no such thing as a non-black Jew. Until he mentioned the word Jerusalem, and he describes in his writings of this particular visit how all at once the atmosphere changed and the villagers he was talking to, who were blasé and disinterested to begin with, suddenly they became mesmerized by the mere mention of the word Jerusalem and they started to bombard him with questions. What's Jerusalem like? What's the Holy Temple like? Have you been there? Are the streets paved with gold? When he explained to them that the temple had been destroyed. They were absolutely crestfallen. They didn't know the temple no longer stood. There was an ancestral longing among the Jews of Ethiopia to return to the land of the forefathers. And every generation believed that they were the ones, they would be the ones to fulfill this prophecy, which was, by the way, a prophecy prophesied by Isaiah, who spoke about the ingathering of the exiles and the return of Jews from the four corners of the world, including the land of Cush. Now, this is Isaiah. This is in about the ninth century BC. He talks about Jews from the land of Cush. Cush corresponds to modern-day Ethiopia, in part. But come 1948, significant year, the year Israel was declared. Nothing changed for the Jews of Ethiopia because they weren't recognized by the state of Israel as proper Jews. Despite this incredible yearning to get back to, they didn't call it Israel by the way, they didn't call it the land of Israel even, they called it the land of Jerusalem. 
this this ancestral longing burnt deep within them but it didn't make a difference because they weren't allowed they weren't recognized under the law of return which applied to every other jew on the planet apart from the jews of ethiopia by the way when the ethiopian jews heard that israel had been declared they danced jubilantly in the streets there's magazine there's a magazine article from the time contemporary magazine article which describes this these scenes and when they heard that israel had been invaded by surrounding arab armies they then fasted for three days and imagine this these people who are who we talk about zionism this their ethiopian jewish zionism predated political zionism by millennia let alone centuries or decades but they were barred by the state of israel as, actually as i was preparing for this talk i found an interesting quotation from a book which is written by a scholar michael coronaldi he quotes that even as late as january 1973 i mean within my lifetime certainly an, an israeli this is the ministry of Absor ministry of absorption in israel it says according to halacha the falasha by the way which is now recognized as a derogatory term the falasha are not recognized as jews and cannot immigrate to israel under the law of return that was 1973 but then that same year there was a sea change the sephardi chief rabbi of israel avadai yosef ruled he issued a declaration for the first time recognizing that the ethiopian jews were as a matter of fact halachically jewish that they were descendants of the tribe of dan and as a result of that in 1975 the israeli government accepted the right of ethiopian jews to to immigrate to israel under the law of return it took that long for them to be able to do it but nothing happened they were allowed to come to israel but there were no attempts to bring them there until 1977 another landmark year why it was the election of menachem begin an israeli prime minister who was really different in every respect to all the other prime ministers who had preceded him and in many ways to prime ministers who have who have followed him he had a meeting with the head of the Mossad, which is conventional when a new prime minister takes office. One of the first activities is to meet the director of the Mossad to discuss ongoing operations. Begin turned to the then head of the Mossad, Yitzhak Hoffi, gave him an instruction. Bring me the Jews of Ethiopia, he told him. It was an order from the prime minister to the Mossad. Now, the Mossad, as we know, is, a, is an intelligence organization. It's an intelligence agency. It's more used to espionage and, let's face it, uh, subterfuge and assassinations than operating as a humanitarian organization. But the order had come from the prime minister. It was the Mossad's job to carry it out. It couldn't turn around and say, I'm sorry, it's not the kind of thing we do. But in those days, and we're talking about the late 1970s, Ethiopia was at war with itself. There were about 15 provinces. Each one is, was in rebellion. There were civil wars and wars within civil wars, tearing Ethiopia to pieces. So the conundrum was, how do you get the Jews of Ethiopia out of there? Ethiopia was ruled by a military junta, a military junta which had overthrown the pro-Israel emperor of Ethiopia, Haile Selassie. The new Ethiopian rulers were known as the Derg, D-E-R-G-U-E, -E, the Derg. They were Marxist revolutionaries, they were pro-Soviet, anti-religion, anti-Zionist. So there was a huge challenge facing the Mossad. It wasn't even known how many Ethiopian Jews there were in these. There were 400 villages. It wasn't known how many Ethiopian Jews resided there. They were absolutely working in the dark. 
they dispatched one of their agents, a man by the name of Danny, to, he smuggled himself into northern Ethiopia. They dispatched him there to check out the lie of the land. He reported back to them, it can't be done. The Jews cannot be taken out of Ethiopia. And then something happened. I'm going to return to my slides. Because along came this person. You should be able to see a black and white image, passport photo of an Ethiopian Jew. His name is Faraday Klum. Faraday Klum. He was an Ethiopian Zionist and he was wanted by the authorities for his Zionist activity. Now, of course, if you're, in Ethiopia, if, you're, if you're Jewish, it's difficult enough in Ethiopia in the 1970s. If you're a Zionist activist, well, you'd be taken away and never heard of again. He had to flee for his life. And he was a fugitive. He went by foot from Ethiopia to Sudan. Remember the, the map which I showed, the, the geography. It's a long way. It's about it's hundreds of kilometers, depending on where you set off from. His walk was about 300 kilometers in the most atrocious conditions, which I'll, I'll come on to again uh, shortly. He resurfaced in Khartoum and he sent a cryptic message to Jewish humanitarian organizations, not to the Mossad, but to Jewish humanitarian organizations, pleading with them to send him an airplane ticket to get him out of there. It was cryptic. It was, you had to be, you had to know what he meant. This message found its way to the Mossad in Tel Aviv and it landed on Danny's desk. Danny was given the job of going to find Faraday in Khartoum because it was figured that if Faraday had successfully managed to get from Ethiopia to Sudan, it could open the way up for more Jews to follow. And if the Jews could be transplanted from Ethiopia to Sudan, then it could be, I use the word easier, let's face it, there's nothing easy about this. Sudan was an enemy Arab country. It could be easier to get the Jews from there, out of there, than it would be to take them from Ethiopia. Sudan was the biggest country in the whole of Africa. Now think about it. Danny's mission was to locate Faraday. And don't, I don't mean to be offensive in the way I put this, but to find a black man in Sudan is... I hate using cliches, but it's akin to finding a needle in a haystack. It took two weeks, but using various means and resourcefulness, Danny found him. And between them, they formed a partnership. A partnership which was so close that Danny referred to him as his brother. In the many conversations I had with Danny, I've met him many, many times now. He told me that Faraday was just like him, but in black. He was an incredibly resourceful individual. And without him, none of what unfolded would have happened. They engineered a plan, the two men to get messages back to Jewish villages, villages, not villagers, but villages in, in Ethiopia, telling them that there was a way, a gateway to Israel, follow Faraday's path. To begin with, only individuals made the journey. Members of Faraday's own family set off by foot from their homes in northern Ethiopia, on pain of death, at night time, under the cover of darkness. But they made it, they succeeded. And as word filtered back to other Jews in Ethiopia, more people followed. It began with handfuls and then trickles 
and then streams. Ultimately, there was a flood, a flood of Jewish refugees making it by foot from northern Ethiopia to the refugee camps in Sudan. Despite what was going on in Ethiopia, civil war, deprivations, uh, hunger, all manner of I mean, repression, this wasn't the reason why the Jews left. It was the reason why thousands, tens and tens of thousands of non-Jewish Ethiopian refugees left. And at this time, there, were, there was a constant flow of Ethiopian refugees to escape the war and the conditions there. They would settle in the refugee camps in Sudan. The reason the Jews left was singularly to get to the land of Israel, the land of Jerusalem. This to them was the realization genuinely of an ancestral dream, of a prophecy. The journey they made by foot, it was, uh, it was an odyssey. They went through hell on earth. So imagine the conditions in Ethiopia in those days. It's bad enough living there. But then to walk at risk of arrest. And of course, if you get arrested, by the way, emigration was not allowed. It was illegal. To emigrate was an arrestable offence. To emigrate in order to get to Israel, you'd never be heard from again. These individuals, men, women, children, the infirm, pregnant women, so on. Whole communities went by foot, up mountains, down mountains, across rivers, through jungle, avoiding wild animals, hyenas, and so on. Bandits, bandits, there were plenty of bandits who would attack people, rob them, kill them on the spot. And then at the end of this, this trek, they had to cross open land to get across the border from Ethiopia to Sudan. It was, it was barren, exposed land in 50 degree heat. And they had no provisions. Some of these journeys took weeks. Many Jews, 10% of the number of Jews, 10% perished on the journey. That's approximately 1,500 people. There was roughly uh, 16,000 Jews ultimately who made the journey by foot, 16,000. About 10% of their number died on the way. To begin with, Danny and Faraday smuggled the Jews from the refugee, ca refugee camps. I'm keeping an eye on the clock. I'm going to try and talk for about another 10 to 15 minutes. Let me go back to sharing the screen. To begin with, Danny and Faraday began to smuggle the Jews. By Land Rover. From Khartoum at night time, I beg your pardon, from Gadara at night time to Khartoum, journey of 200 plus kilometers. They docked, by the way, this is Danny. And here, this figure smiling, this is Faraday. These are Jewish refugees, Ethiopians, plucked from the refugee camps in Sudan. So they began by passing them through the airport in Khartoum using doctored passports. Also, I hasten to add, the Ethiopian Jews had never seen a plane. They'd never, in many cases, had never seen a motor car. Some had never seen a light bulb, but they were being asked to put their faith in, this, in these two individuals. It was a complete leap of faith going off into the unknown in the expectation, the hope, the aspiration that it would lead them to Israel. But the more Jews who started to uh, appear in the refugee camps, the more difficult it became because of the sheer numbers. So the Mossad had to look for a different way of coping with getting large numbers of Jews out of the country. And this is where they decided to adopt naval evacuations by sending a ship, a mothership, from Israel secretly down the Red Sea to anchor off the coast of Sudan. Of course, remember, Sudan was an enemy Arab country. The, the plan was 
to anchor this, this ship, this vessel, to dispatch Israeli Navy SEALs by dinghy to come and pick up Jewish refugees from the coast, take them back to the mothership, and then sail them back to Israel. In order to do this, they needed a suitable landing bay on the beach. Danny was instructed to find somewhere that would be suitable for this. And this is the moment he stumbled across what's now become famous as the Mossad's fake diving resort. I'll explain what I mean by that. What you see here is actually, uh, it's from Google Maps. It's still visible if you know where to look and zoom in. This is a peninsula. This is Arus. Remember the map I showed you, I pointed to a location just north of Port Sudan called Arus. Well, this is it. There was a rundown former holiday village there. By the way, they all, I mean, I'm skipping such a lot of incredible detail, all of which is described in full in the book. I really, really encourage you to read about it. Danny found this derelict village and it occurred to him there and then that if the Mossad could, uh, could requisition it somehow, they could turn it round and relaunch it as a Club Med Star resort, as a fake diving resort, a cover for the operatives to operate as hotel staff by day and carry out the people smuggling operations by night in the desert, all under the noses, by the way, of the Sudanese authorities. They concocted, the Mossad concocted a fake holiday company called Navco. No such thing exist, existed. They passed themselves off as representatives and the Sudanese Tourism Commission leased the village to Navco, which was a Mossad front. Mossad invested $100,000 to repair the place, get it ship shape and acceptable as a, as, a, as a luxury resort on the Red Sea coast. I've annotated what it looked like at the time. You can see it comprised a chain of chalets, uh, 15 in all, many of which were guest rooms. Three were reserved for the Mossad agents. The Mossad agents, by the way, operated here as diving instructors. Many of them were former Israeli Navy SEALs. So can you imagine if you're a, if you're a, if you're a guest at a resort and you go for on a diving expedition, terrific. I mean, you're in the safe hands of an, of an Israeli, ex-Israeli Navy SEAL. But of course, this wasn't divulged. It was kept top secret. They passed themselves off as as uh, nationals from various European countries. At the bottom here, by the way, was the diving store where they kept uh, diving equipment, genuine diving equipment, air, cylin air cylinders, so on, but also their secret radio equipment, which they would use to communicate with Mossad HQ back in Tel Aviv. One of the air cylinders, by the way, was remanufactured by, you know, in James Bond, as of course, I was, sooner or later, I was going to mention James Bond. Uh, in James Bond, there's, uh, what is it, Q, who has his, uh, his department, which, uh, which manufactures all kinds of uh, gadgetry. There's, a, there's something similar in the Mossad, and they, they devised an air cylinder which couldn't be tampered with, but it uh, could be opened if you knew how, and inside was the secret communication equipment. The Mossad uh, produced thousands of these glossy brochures to advertise this resort at travel agents across Europe. It looks beautiful and it's incredibly tempting. The shores there were just teeming with exotic fish. Uh, it was unexplored, it was incredibly attractive if you're an adventurous holiday maker or a diving enthusiast. Uh, Arus, a wonderful world apart with so much to see and do. This is all Mossad by the way, remember. I don't know if you can see here, I always like to point this out, there's a very small figure of an individual. If you can't see this, you just have to trust me. He's, uh, he's got his back to us. He's kind of walking away from the camera towards this beautiful turquoise sea. 
This is an actual fact. One of the Mossad agents who was an operative in this uh, in this operation, as a, as an in joke, he was involved in the manufacture of these brochures. He planted himself in the uh, in the image. This is a picture of a group of Mossad agents having breakfast one morning in the hotel resort. Oh, by the way, I must say that guests came from all around the world, ordinary people, holidaymakers, diving enthusiasts, but also diplomats, top diplomats, ambassadors serving in Khartoum, stayed at the Mossad, the fake Mossad resort, and they never knew. Among the ambassadors were ambassadors and, diploma and diplomatic officials from enemy Arab countries who would rub shoulders with the Mossad staff. The Egyptian ambassador used to enjoy playing backgammon with the diving instructors. Uh, there was a French military attaché who was a frequent uh, returning visitor. He would have plenty of casual conversations and let these uh, let the staff the diving team know about this or that, but of course he was passing information on unwittingly. Just to point out, and I'm going to speak for five more minutes and then I'll take questions, just to point out some of the people in this picture. This is Danny, uh, the commander of the operation in the field. Phenomenal individual, I mean, I mean that, an absolute hero in every, you know, the word hero is banded around a lot these days. Hero, everybody's branded a hero if they do this or that, but what a phenomenal individual. If it wasn't for him, none of what, have ha what was accomplished could have been achieved. By the way, during lockdown in Israel, I was speaking to him on the phone, I asked him what he's, what he's been up to. He said, oh, you know, this and that. And uh, one of the things he was doing was taking food deliveries voluntarily taking food deliveries to elderly Ethiopian Jews who couldn't leave their houses in the back of his car, taking food to them. Tremendous advocate. Yola Reitman is the lady here. She was one of three female receptionists who were brought in uh, quite deliberately because they were women. The idea was that they would lower suspicions if there, was women, if there were women serving at the resort, then. Sudanese intelligence agents, who, by the way, were everywhere, would be less suspicious of something into war going, going on. She also is an incredible individual, a formidable person, a humanitarian. And I have to say, if it wasn't for her, what she managed to do, the operation wouldn't have succeeded. The picture you see here is of a small Ethiopian child who's been smuggled from the camp in Qadarif by the Mossad, transferred into the hands of Israeli Navy SEALs, who then took him and other Ethiopian Jews back to the mothership, uh, which, as I said, was anchored some 25, 30 kilometers off the coast of Sudan, and then transported back to Israel. Uh, it's worth pointing out the life jacket that you see the child wearing. This was specifically manufactured by the Mossad because of the conditions, the dangerous conditions in the sea, uh, there weren't available life jackets for children. So the Mossad had them purposely manufactured. That's the, that's the lengths they went to, to make sure that these people were taken to safety. There was, after several of the naval evacuations, there was an ambush on the beach. Sudanese soldiers stumbled across one of the, one of the operations as it was in, underway. Uh, it was, there was a crisis. One of the Sudanese soldiers opened fire with, with uh, automatic gunfire. He sprayed the, the dinghies containing the Ethiopian Jews and the Navy SEALs with machine gun fire. But miraculously, not a single bullet hit his target and the Jews managed to be taken off away safely. And the Mossad agents on the beach diffused that, uh, that situation. But because of that, the Mossad decided to uh, abandon evacuations by sea. And they adopted a new modus operandi, which was airlift. 
They flew in Hercules aircraft to a landing strip inside of Sudan, deep inside enemy country, enemy territory. Absolutely perilous for the Hercules pilots alone. This was to fly a plane in the under darkness, without its lights, uh, under the uh, detection range of enemy radar, uh, across mountains also. The coast of Sudan is mountainous. To land and to, to pick up to rendezvous with the Mossad and the Ethiopian Jewish refugees in limited time, like 50, a window of 15 minutes to be able to do it, which was astonishing. They had provisions, by the way, in case things went wrong. They would blow up the Hercules. They carried explosives on these planes. They blow them up and then they try and make escape on foot across the border with Egypt. None of that was ever necessary because every single airlift was accomplished, spot on. Nothing went wrong. Miraculous. I say nothing went wrong. Think plenty of things went wrong. Nothing failed. But there were one of the things that struck me throughout this incredible operation was the number of times it should have been scuppered. But something kept it going. Something intervened to make sure that this operation was fully accomplished. There was a, an attempted ambush of one of the aircraft during one of the operations. And as a result of that, the Mossad reverted back to naval evacuations. And they switched from, event, from the sea to the air, from the air to the sea, until eventually the last airlift occurred in late 1984, or mid-1984. But there were so many Jews by that stage, desperate to leave refugee camps, that the trucks which were sent to pick them up, one of the trucks collapsed under the weight of the Jews. It was, uh, it was catastrophic. They had to be sent back to the camps and only some of those Jews were taken on the last Mossad-led airlift out of the country. I'm gonna conclude with the end of the operation and I just want to spend a moment, it'll take less than five minutes, I want to spend a moment to talk about, uh, I'll explain because I'll go on to my final slide. So how, what happened in the end of this, this resort? In April 1985, there was a revolution in Sudan. The president was overthrown and a new, uh, new leadership took over. The Mossad in Tel Aviv uh, discovered that agents in the country in Sudan had been uh, had been uncovered by Sudanese intelligence and they had to get them out of there. They sent an order to the agents operating at this fake diving resort to evacuate with immediate effect, but the, the agents couldn't do so because the hotel was teeming, it was full of guests to maximum capacity. They couldn't just walk out of there. They had to wait a full week until the final guest left. Then they made their excuses to the local staff. They had you know, Eritreans and Ethiopians working there as chambermaids and uh, waiters and, uh, and handymen. They said, we're going away for a couple of days to look for a new diving spot up the coast. But they didn't go up the coast, they went into the desert and they were plucked in an emergency airlift by an Israeli plane which was sent to rescue them before it was too late. I want to end by showing you something very important. This picture you see, these, these, uh, these monuments, these obelisks, this is on Mount Herzl in Jerusalem, the national cemetery of the state of Israel. This, this portion of the cemetery is dedicated to Ethiopian Jews. I don't know if you can see, but there's lists, there's columns of names inscribed on these stones, approximately 1,500. 1,500 names of every Ethiopian Jewish person who perished trying to get to the land of Israel. On Jerusalem Day every year, the Ethiopian Jews are honored. Jerusalem Day is one of the most important dates in the 
Israeli of, of Jewish calendar. It, uh, it marks the reunification of Jerusalem. Now, the, Jerusalem, the city of Jerusalem. Why is this also marked as a day to honor Ethiopian Jews? Because of the level of importance Jerusalem has had and has to them. On this day, the heads of Israel, the president, the prime minister, the head of the armed forces, the leaders of all the political parties and the heads of civil society, they all attend a ceremony at Mount Herzl where leaders of Ethiopian Jewish society are. The president of Israel bows, he bows to them in honor of what they went through to get to Israel. To, be, to begin with, when the operation began rather, it wasn't known how many Jews there were in Ethiopia, but we now know there were 36,000. They were on the brink of extinction. Remember the quote which I read from Cultural Survival Magazine, the most threatened Jewish community on the face of the earth. These days in Israel, there are approximately 150,000 Ethiopian Jews. They're absolutely flourishing. I think it's safe to say that as a result of this Mossad-led operation, this, the ruses that they employed, the in ingenuity, the dangers that they put themselves through, and in equal measure, because of the actions the Ethiopian Jews themselves took to make this possible, it's safe to say that their future is sadly secured. I'm sorry I overrun a little bit, but I'm happy to take questions. Rafi, that was fantastic. Thank you so much. It was uh, so much detail. I think we could have listened, we could listen for another hour or even longer. It's just wonderful, wonderful account. And the first a comment from, uh, from Kim, who said, this is an amazing account. So that's a good way to start. That's and uh, <laughs> and uh, a question from Lillian Levy. What language did the Ethiopian Jews speak? Amharic. They spoke Amharic, which is the one of the languages, the main language of Ethiopia. Uh, they didn't know Hebrew. Well, they did more recently, but until the until the, the, the mid twentieth century, they they knew no Hebrew. The the books that they prayed from, their equivalent of the Torah, they knew it as the Orit, O R I T, Orit. Orit was written in Ge'ez. Ge'ez was the uh, the, the, the liturgical language used not just by the Jews of Ethiopia, but by the Christians of Ethiopia as well. So they prayed in Gaze and they spoke Amharic. Okay. And a follow-up question from Diana. What language did Danny use to communicate with them? Uh, that's a good question. Danny used uh, English because uh, Faraday uh, spoke English, was educated, and, uh, and of course Faraday yeah, I spoke Amharic. Uh, there's some French as well. Some French was known. Danny was uh, was part French, so that came in useful. Wonderful. And a question from Andrew Kaufman. How did this operation morph into Operation Moses? Brilliant question. I say that because without this operation, Operation Moses would never have happened. Operation Moses happened because of the sheer volume of Jews needing to be brought out of Sudan. The Mossad-led operation was finite in the, in, the, in, the, in the number it could bring out, but by the mid-1984, by mid we're talking about, uh, you know, the majority of the Ethiopian Jewish community was languishing in the camps of Sudan. So a plan was devised to, with the, uh, but the tacit agreement of the president of Sudan, he agreed to turn a blind eye to allow uh, planes to be flown uh, from, from Europe, not from Israel, but from Europe, to bring the Ethiopian Jews out uh, and taken not directly onto Israel, but to, uh, to Europe first, which is, uh, which is precisely what happened. That's great. And uh, Cheryl Lee would like to ask you a question. Cheryl? Yeah. Oh, thank you so much. Riveting, riveting. Um, what are your thoughts about 
you said that the um, Ethiopian government were totally anti-religious. So on that basis, why were they not happy for their Jewish um, population to leave? You, you said that immigration was illegal. Correct. So I just wondered how that squared up. And the other couple of things I wanted to ask was, do you know, or how many people do you think were involved in, in the rescue operation? And how did um, Faraday manage to get messages out, out of Ethiopia to anyone when, when you said he contacted um, Jewish organizations to help? Yeah. Okay, uh, I'll try and re remember those three questions and I'll take them in, in reverse order. Uh, Faraday, while he was a a Zionist activist in Ethiopia, he had some uh, direct dealings with uh, Jewish organizations, uh, one of which was the uh, Hebrew uh, HIAS, uh, H-I-A-S, which is still functioning, Hebrew Immigrant Aid uh, Society. And uh, it was uh, the Hi through the HIAS that uh, Faraday's message uh, was uh, communicated to the Mossad, it was sent to HIAS first by, by Faraday. How he got information back to Ethiopia uh, once he was in Sudan. Um, as it's explained in the book, he and Danny actually went on a undercover trip back from Sudan to Ethiopia. Uh, Danny was under strict instructions, by the way, not to go to Ethiopia, but he defied it. One of the reasons he was successful in what he did was he knew when to challenge authority. This was one of those occasions. Interestingly, he blacked himself up using uh, using coal dust, uh, using um, what's it, uh, ash from burnt wood uh, oh, cool. to 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 pass himself off, uh, off as, as as a black Jew. Uh, but in the when he went to the village in Ethiopia, of course, the elders <laughs> looked at him very quizzically and uh, realised that he, he wasn't a black man. Um, the first, uh, the first question. Oh, about uh, the Ethiopian authorities wanting. Uh, why weren't they? Why didn't they want the Jews out of the country? Uh, it wasn't a case of they wanted to get rid of the Jews. It's not. It's, you can't equate it to European anti-Semitism. The government itself wasn't. It wasn't uh, anti. It wasn't an anti-Semitic government. It. It. Um, it was anti anti religion because it was it was, it was Marxist, so it didn't didn't believe in the, you know put kind of uh, the uh, it, it put the, um, the, the the country the concept of, uh, of of country and nation nationhood first, uh, but the governor of Gondor, the eighty five percent of the Jews lived in the region of Gondor. He was anti Semitic. He 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 uh, enacted some some very anti Semitic uh, measures, but. Uh, but in short, it wasn't a case of wanting to get rid of the Jews. Just there were many minorities in Ethiopia, and if if one of the if one of the minorities uh, was allowed to leave the country, then you know it would ferment unrest among the the other minorities as well. That's great. Thank you. Uh, there's there's a, a question um, about, and and I've seen the film, the film on Netflix. Well, just what is your opinion quickly? On that. Yes. Okay. Um, I'm glad you brought that up because it's actually a really important um, thing to mention. So there's a film called The Red Sea Diving Resort that came out uh, last year. Uh, it's a it's it's a representation. It's a depiction of what happened, but it's not a true it's not a true depiction. And in fairness to the makers of the movie, they do print on screen uh, that this film is inspired by real events, not even based on real events, inspired by. Mm -hmm. But the problem there is, I mean, watch the film. It, 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 the good thing is it's kind of created awareness that uh, these events, something like it went on. Um, but the problem, number of problems with the movie, apart from some scenes are completely fictitious, is the way that it represents what happened as a, as a rescue of the, uh, of the passive black Jews by heroic white men, not just Israelis, but the CIA. In the movie, the CIA has a mm. central role. In reality, the CIA had nothing to do with the operation. It was purely Israeli, it was Mossad-led, A to Z. 
But uh, an interesting point is uh, Danny, the commander of the operation, he was, um, he was a consultant on the movie. And one of the reasons he, uh, he was willing to collaborate with me on the book is because he was concerned that if it was left to the movie alone, the telling of these events would be la largely fictitious. It would misrepresent mm -hmm. what happened. So he agreed to write the book with me on the basis that it would be an authentic account of what took place. And thankfully, he was delighted with the end product, uh, which is a tremendous relief to me, of course. Um, <laughs> it just also prompted me to, uh, I'd like to just share with you what, uh, this is really, to me, this really extremely poignant uh, quote, which comes from the New York Times in 1985. And I think it's particularly poignant because of what's going on currently, the current climate with Black Lives Matter, what's going on in this day and age. Now, remember, we're talking about 1985. How long is that? Uh, how many years ago? 35 years ago? Mm -hmm. Something like that? My math isn't so good uh, under, under the pressure of, uh, of Zoom. But New York Times, January 1985. This is when Operation Moses was, was exposed. It was a secret operation, but it was then exposed in 1985, the media around the world led with it as a story. This is a columnist in the New York Times. For the first time in history, thousands of black people are being brought into a country, not in chains, but in dignity, not as slaves, but as citizens. This is the tiny state of Israel in 1985, light years ahead of many, many other countries on earth. And uh, I think we can take a tremendous amount of satisfaction from that. That's great. Thank you. And I think we'll finish with uh, one last comment and question from Rosalind Chogger. Please, Rosalind. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Rafi, for all the research you've done and this fascinating story. I've spent a lot of time in Ethiopia with the Jewish community in Gonda and all across the country. Um, the, there's a little community you know, called Kitchener in Addis, and the leaders of that community told me that there are over 50,000 Jews still in Ethiopia, in the mountains, in the villages, some of them living alone as Jews, not in a Jewish community. Um, and some of them are even uh, worshipping uh, in secret in caves in the mountains, uh, where they've still got monks and nuns, which they sort of took from their mixing with the Ethiopian Orthodox Church. So I just wanted to say that this is a wonderful, all the airlifts that happened and people went to Israel, but there are lots of people who are still waiting in Gonda, have been waiting 30 plus years, mm. and who have no way of making a proper living because they came from rural communities in the mountains and they're now in a town and they don't have the expertise of town dwellers. So uh, I just thought that should yeah. be added on to it because no, you make a... it sounds as if everybody who wanted to leave mm. left. And that's just... you, know, you, make, you make a very good point. I've never heard the figure 50,000. I'm not disputing it. I've never heard the figure. What we do know is that there are about 8,000, you'll know what I'm talking about, 8,000 or so, Falashmura, which is a term which may ring a bell with, with a few people. Falashmura are descendants of Jews who were forcibly converted to Christianity by, uh, by uh, Protestant uh, evangelicals who went to Ethiopia in the late 19th century. Uh, over time, the, uh, the, the, uh, the Falash Mura, the, the Christians married into the Jewish community and so on. Uh, so the, the, let's call them authentic Jews, were taken to Israel, no doubt about it. Uh, almost to the, to the almost, almost all of them. Are you shaking your head? I'll come back to you in a second. Uh, there's, a, there's an ongoing and a long-term ongoing, it's extremely contentious whether the Falash Mura uh, have entitlement to go to Israel. But the, Israel's newly appointed immigration minister has declared that within a year or two, perhaps she said two years, uh, she, will, she, she aims to bring to Israel the remaining uh, Falash Mura. Uh, but please give, give, uh, give you the right, to re right of response. 
No, the, the, the problem I see, um, and has always been from the beginning, is that because these were pre-Talmudic Jews, yeah. they went through the father's line, Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. That's yes. what they thought they should do. Correct. So still, they believe they're Jews, many of the yes. people who marry intermarried, because it's the father that's Jewish. But I know yes. families who are Jewish through and through in Gonda, yeah. and their, family, their relatives are in Israel, but they yes. are still stuck. Completely. I, I absolutely, I'm, I'm at one with you on this. The problem, of course, is providing documentary evidence. Now, how can you provide, doc you're, you're, you come from the mountains in Ethiopia. How do you, we can do it with, you know, I, I've got my Ketuba, it's very easy. If you're in Ethiopia, this is, this is one of the problems. It's a very difficult problem, but, you know, I'm kind of not, I'm not trying to evade the answer, but, you know, I, I, perhaps I'm not uh, equipped to give you a, 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 an authoritative answer apart from, it's an ongoing issue. There's, uh, probably it's a a more, there's probably a more pressing problem because the ethnic violence today, at this present moment, is so terrible. So many people are being murdered that the Jews, if they don't get airlifted, airlifted soon, <laughs> goodness knows what's going to happen. Correct. Thank you, Rosalind, for, uh, for your question and comments. And Rafi, thank you so much. Thank you on behalf of all our members. And, uh, and all of us at AJR. And I think most people are on mute, but we're all gonna clap anyway. Thank you so much. And I, and I think there may even be some follow-up questions. So if, if anyone wants to email me, it's karendiamond at ajr.org.uk. I'd be happy to forward them to Rafi. And, um, and again, here's Rafi's book, Red Sea Spies. I've read it, I love it, I loved it. And you'll get the whole story of the book. And uh, hopefully Rafi will come back and speak to us again. So thank you so much, everyone, and have a great afternoon. Bye-bye. Thank you.